my husband has seemed to have a change of values over the past couple years. What are one or two that are driving you, like scaring you, making you uncomfortable? We both grew up in the same religion. He still somewhat believes, but he also likes to say that I've been brainwashed. What's going on? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show, a show about your marriage, your kids, your emotional health, your mental health, whatever you got going on in the world. Holidays are coming up. You just have survived, or maybe you didn't survive Thanksgiving, and we're right into Christmas. I saw something recently. Man, Christmas and Thanksgiving should be six months apart because we just need to recover. Here we are, not to mention political mess, drama, just tons of heartbreak going on overseas. It's just one thing after another. And then there's you sitting at home, sitting on the couch next to somebody that you're married to, feeling six inches apart, but 6,000 miles away. Your kids struggling, school's a mess, your mental health, is whatever's going on in your life. Everybody's there. Everybody's there. Here's my promise on this show. I'll sit with you. The show's real people going through real challenges in real time. I'll sit with you and we will figure out what we're going to do next. I care about you. I care about people. And I got a vested interest in this because I got two little kids, man. And they're not little anymore. I got two young kids. And you all, the listeners of this show, the people who join me on the show, y'all are building the world that they're going to inhabit. And so I want us to all get it right. And what we're doing is not working. So let's try to do something new. If you want to be on the show, give me a buzz at 1-844-693-3291. It's 1-844-693-3291 or go to johndeloney.com slash ask. And it's not too late. They may all be sold out by now, but it's worth getting on there and checking them out. Questions for humans, the Christmas edition. We sold all the way out of them last year. Um, we're recording this in the middle of November and they just told me well, there's no way that they're still around by the time Christmas comes around, but it may there may be, still be some left. And Kelly, let's run through a few questions. Questions for humans. Nice. All right. First one. <laughs> you just weren't very believable just then. Nice. Uh, nice. Uh-huh. And when do you really and truly feel like it's Christmas time? Man, when when we put our live Christmas tree up in the house, and I'm a I have a weird thing. I I ha- we all have to be a part of decorating it. Everybody's got to be there. We got to put on weird music, and Same. we all have to do it and go through the box. And yeah. it'd be so much easier if just one person just knocked it out. And if you're like us, we have to talk about each ornament. And I oh, remember when they got this, and then blah blah blah. And you and I were talking the other day, like all the kids put all the ornaments in like the same six inch spot. Uh-huh. And then I fix it after everybody goes to bed. We all have to be a part of it, and that's after that. I feel like it is Christmas, Christmas, Christmas. Yeah, that's a good one. What about you? Um, honestly, ours for me, it's our. When you see me, yes, e- e- that feels like Christmas it, every day. It's just Christmas <laughs> in my heart. Every day. You don't mm-hmm. have a heart, but, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> in that in your chest cavity, in my chest cavity where it should be. Um, no, my the thing for me is our church's choir concert. It's such a big moment for us every year. You would. Um, it's just, it is. It's, it's like three amigos when they're like, I would buy cars. <laughs> I would do this. I would build an orphanage. My husband sings in the <laughs> choir. Uh-huh. And our um, our choir is is something to behold. I mean, we, I go to a big church, so there's a lot of it. And it's just always a fantastic production, but they do it simply. It's not like Vegas, you know, it's beautiful. And um, we didn't get to go last year because we were at my mother's service. And so it felt really weird. It was like a marker that didn't happen. And so we're looking forward to it this year. It feels a lot like there's going to be a parumpa pum pum slid in there at that concert. Um, sometimes there actually one year they had like a high school drum corps, so sometimes there is. Ugh. I do. I I will say I get up and go to the bathroom if they play Mary. Did you know? Because she knew. <laughs> she knew. She knew. The angel told her. <laughs> I won't get on that soapbox. And if there was little drummer boy, I would have to just leave. See, I like little drummer boy. Well, that's because you have diagnos- diagnosable mental illness. All right, let's go to the next one. <laughs> What Christmas movie gets way too much hype? This is a this is a potentially oh, dude, divisive hot take, question. Dude. Jimmy, Jimmy. It's a Wonderful Life. I hate that movie. Not a great movie. No, I don't hate it. I don't like it though. Yeah. we don't watch it. Not a good movie. 
The sentiment's With great. You. Hey, if you weren't here, other people might not have as much yeah. joy. It's kind of a horror movie. Or my wife might have found some way wealthier, way better looking <laughs> guy and her life would be incredible. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not a fan. Yeah, not a fan. Not a fan. What's an underrated Christmas movie? Jenna Muppet Christmas Carol. <laughs> I love the Muppet Christmas Carol. Yeah, we both too. love We've the Muppet Christmas come, Carol. We've both come across some people who have don't like Muppets at all, so they yeah. don't like that. And you I know why? Because they're, they're sociopaths. Yeah. Right, exactly. Muppet Christmas Carol is, is it's awesome. So it's the best version of the Christmas Nightmare Carol. Before Christmas is my number one of all time. Um, there's one on Netflix and that a lot of people may not know about. It's called Jingle Jangle. And it's if you liked The Greatest Showman, you'll love it. I know the title's stupid. But if you like The Greatest Showman, you'll love it because it's the same choreographer, same music, same costuming. But it's a really great uh, Forrest Whitaker's in it. It's just this like you watch it and you're like, I feel really good. Oh, I know that movie. Yeah. yeah. It's a great Christmas movie. But when you say the words Jingle Jangle, I, I just imagine you running through like, <laughs> like a park with meth in your pocket. That just feels like Jingle Jangle. <laughs> Like, that's just, the, that's the thought I have. What you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> I don't know. Let's go out to Virginia and talk to the M A double T. What's up, Matt? How are we doing? Hey, Dr. John. Uh, thanks for taking my call, man. Pretty, uh, pretty excited. Pretty nervous. <laughs> oh, don't be nervous. I'm excited, but don't be nervous. All right. So what's up, dude? No, I'm, I'm nervous because my girlfriend's going to listen to this because she's the reason that, uh, I'm listening to you and called you and, oh, she, uh, all right. Choose your words carefully, her, man. Choose your words carefully. <laughs> What's up? Yeah, she knows about it. So I'll jump to the question and then circle back. Um, it's because of a call that you took last week about the guy who wanted more communication and I identified with him a lot and you told her to run. So my question is, uh, am I, am I that guy? Uh, also, am I asking too much? Uh, and if so, you know, how do I make peace with, uh, the relationship where our communication styles are so different and I don't get as much as I want. And there's lots of background. Yeah. So <laughs> you could do a 10 part series on us, man. You would love it. <laughs> oh, man, I appreciate your call. Um, so, Hey Kelly, can you fill me in on that? Um, I don't think we, we, Matt, we record these sometimes up to a month apart. Mm -hmm. So I don't yeah. remember that call. Um, I think it was the one who the uh, that he's talking about is the guy. The woman called in, and her if she didn't text her boyfriend first thing in the morning, oh, all yeah. communication all day long, and you know if if she didn't text by nine, he yeah, was mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So yeah, moving the goalpost, you better run, girl. That kind of one. <laughs> yes. Okay. So you're that that guy sounds like you, right? A little bit. Uh, we diverge. Um, in some areas, but yeah, the, the feelings of being an afterthought, I mean, I don't need, I don't need calls every 10 seconds or anything crazy. And I don't need detailed lists of what she does, but I do feel like there's such a huge gap in our communication. And I have also moved the goalposts, but, um, to use a football analogy, I've moved them closer. I don't ask for 10 yards for a touchdown. I just want her to hike the damn ball. I'll give her right. a touchdown. Well, and, and I and, feel like every, go ahead. Oh, I said, I feel like every time I, I, I ask for less and less because she says she can't give more, I, I, I ask for less and less. And she still says, nope, too much, nope, too much, nope, too much. And it's tough because it's, it's, I don't want to be that guy who's driving her away and making her want to run. But I just, I love this woman with all my heart. And I just want to, I just love talking to her and hearing from her and that sort of thing. So it sounds like she's moving the goalpost back. So or she's moving the goalpost too. Let me just put it that way. Um, let me let me try to ask the question this way. Sure. Um, well, let me let you ask your question. What's your question? So it, it, it's it's if I'm asking too much, if I'm if I am being overbearing, um, you know, we don't. We're both divorced with kids, live a town apart, and she has her kids week on, week off. I've got mine maybe a third of the time. And during those sometimes seven to 10 days that we don't see each other, I really crave that connection, at least through the telephone, because we don't get to physically see each other much. Um, and that's when it really feels like I, I feel like an afterthought. She even she even said extraneous uh, at one point, you know, and uh, it was tough. I mean, I used the word first, to be very fair. But she's like, yeah, you do feel extraneous during those times when I've just got the kids and I'm dealing with them. And, and yeah, I don't have time for you. So what, what, uh, what a tough, yeah. I mean, no, I don't think that's, I don't, you don't sound like that other guy at all to me. Now, maybe you listened and felt that way, but I don't, I don't hear that at all. Um, 
why when she has her kids, do y'all not see each other? Um, so we, we used to, um, heck we even, we were even engaged for two weeks a couple months ago. <laughs> She's got, um, a, a daughter who's 14, who's doing the classic. I hate mom. Cause I'm a teenager. And I want to kill myself when I'm around you sort of thing. I mean, and that's not really the classic. Seems like she's got a lot of struggle, struggles, but maybe not classic, but th- there's that, there's that angst between mom and teenage daughter. And then it's to the point where she was making suicidal ideations and even cutting. And it hadn't occurred right after our engagement. Cause she's like, I don't want you guys to be engaged. I don't, I don't, I don't want a new life. Um, and so my girlfriend called off the engagement, um, after a couple of weeks because of that, not only that there's a Ramsey solutions connection. I had a little more depth than she realized. And she's like, well, step back, you know, and I'm working, we're working on that. I'm on step two, but, um, what, uh, what do you mean? Like she realized you, you finally came clean about you owe a whole bunch of money in debt. Right. She knew about, she knew about student loans, uh, from law school, um, and uh, a little credit card debt. She knew that my, the, the firm that I I'm about to leave has been really financially tough on me. And I didn't really disclose how tough it had been. So after the engagement, I said, I gave her a spreadsheet and said, here I am. And she's like, Ooh, that's more than I expected. Um, but we, we worked a plan, you know, to, to, to do it together. Um, she's a financial whiz. She's got, I mean, she's just phenomenal. Um, and I'm struggling and that coupled with the daughter sort of, I shouldn't be going off the deep end, but the stress with the daughter, she's like, this is too much. We need to step back. Okay. So that's why I don't get to come around that often anymore. Cause it seems to stress out her daughter. Now her daughter's living with her, her ex-husband, um, now more full time because of the stress. So I may be invited around a little bit more, but I, that hasn't happened yet in the last month. And so it's, it's just tough. Yeah. Um, man, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give it to you straight. Is that cool? Yeah, please. I think these communication challenges and the, I'm all in, but wait, hold on. Let's, let's take a breather. Let me see the spreadsheet. All of this feels like theater to a much bigger issue in your relationship together. Okay. Feel, it feels like they're, y'all are not nearly as close as you want to be. Yeah. And y'all are not nearly as far apart as she would feel safe. And so what happens is it's almost like uh, two magnets that are turned the wrong way. Y'all just push each other away so hard. Pursuer distance or kind of dynamic. But yeah, it just becomes a, you've heard me say it on the show, it just becomes a dance where yeah. I'm starving. I can't breathe. I can't breathe, but I can't breathe. And you're my oxygen. And then the, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. You're smothering me. And yeah. she's using you as, as an excuse to, um, she's using distance from you as an excuse to make herself her alarm bells not ring off the hook because she probably went through a gnarly divorce that was a mess and she has a daughter that's chaotic that's dude you can't you can't let you can't let a, a teenager dictate your life they they that young girl cannot handle the power of determining her mom's dating relationships that's too much that's too much power to give to a child she can't carry that yeah. weight well you hit the nail on the head with the terrible divorce uh, her ex-husband married the paramour the, the mistress that caused the divorce and moved her in right away. And I, and I, we, we suspect that that has something to do with the, um, resistance to our relationship, you know, well, it, but like at the same interloper, but at the same time, um, your, your financial insecurity, your professional insecurity, you work in a very, very difficult job. Nobody calls an attorney because they're having a great day, right? So you enter into people's <laughs> pain every day of your life as yeah. um, uh, as a way of being. And so you've identified her, your body's identified her as your as a cup of water, as your oxygen. And when you don't get it, man, you text more. Where are you? Why aren't you me? I, am I just an afterthought? And it's that, it's that internal, can't breathe, can't breathe, can't breathe. Can't, like when you're underwater a little bit too long and then the kid won't get off of you and all of a sudden your body goes to full Right. And it just gets to that weird dance. That's, that's it. A hundred percent. That's it. That's what it feels like. It's, so, yeah. So, it's so, a craving. <laughs> yeah. 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 
And so for me, um, I think the conversation has to be way, way beneath communication style. By the way, that language is so frustrating for me, not to you. I'm, I'm really grateful that y'all are identifying I communicate this way, I communicate that way. It's super frustrating to me that those type of sim- overly simplistic models are placed in the world because they give people a relational out. What do I mean by that? Well, my love language is touch. Well, my love language is nice, is affirmations. And we just aren't compatible. And I just want to yell from the rooftops. That's so, so stupid. There's nothing empirical about any of that. All of that changes over time. And if my if I'm in tune with my wife, I know that she likes to be hugged when she's when she's hurting. And she, if she's in tune with me, she knows that I like it when she puts her hand on the back of my neck and says, "Hey, I'm proud of you." Like it, we don't have to devolve into this. I don't do that kind of love language. My I do what my partner needs and vice versa. And so I, if y'all have different communication styles out of the gate, great. I don't really care. What does she need and what do you need? Right. If yeah. my well, wife and needs and it's shifted me over time, that's, that's the thing. It always, always moves. Right. What's important yeah. is that every month you say, Hey, dude, I'm getting ready. It's getting super stressful at work. And like just a quick hello in the morning. Abs- like it changes the whole nature of my day. Would you, yeah. would you love me enough to say hello? And she'd be like, yeah, I got that. And if she can't do that, then your relationship has much bigger issues in it. Or if she says, hey, dealing with my daughter in the morning is so difficult. And every morning I wake up in a panic that she's even still alive or that there's blood on the sheets again. And like just the thought of having a chore to do, which is I got to make sure I call him back three times can I call you when I get to work? And you'd be like, yeah, absolutely, babe. That'd be awesome. But until y'all have that level of conversation, um, it's just going to be this ping pong match of, well, you did this, well, you didn't do this. And it just becomes theater for the deeper issues here. Yeah. And it sounds, and by the way, the scariest thing for somebody who went through a bad divorce who is scanning the environment 24-7, 365 for am I safe, am I safe, am I safe? is finding out that the person that they almost went all in on didn't tell them the full truth. Yeah, no, I, I, I know that I, I was definitely wrong. Um, that's a huge regret. Yeah. Yeah. Have you, have you said that in that way? (sighs) I I don't know. I know I've apologized and said, I'm sorry. I didn't tell you this earlier. Um, I think it's deeper than that. I I failed you. Yeah. No, I did. That's a hundred percent accurate. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I failed in my I failed in my last marriage. You know, it was my fault. So it's like in what way? I'm. Oh, uh, I stepped out on okay. the marriage. Okay. Uh, I I wasn't I wasn't honest with my ex wife that okay. I was hurting and feeling unloved and feeling uh, worthless and devalued. And I found somebody that made me feel good for a little while. Sure. And, uh, sure. I just don't want I don't want to make those mistakes because like this woman is the light of my life and. And I think when she said it before, when our highs are high, they are, they're, they're, they're to the moon and back. Cause yeah. we just, you know, we're both, we both have similar jobs. Like she's active duty military. I'm reserved now, but, um, you know, we've got these, we, we have so much common ground and just love food and I love to cook and she loves to eat. And I do too. You know, I just, it's so much is so good. It's intense. It's, I mean, I, we both said that we fell in love the minute we walked into the coffee shop the first time we met, you know, and that's probably damn accurate <laughs> and it's, it's been wonderful, but those lows are just, you know, to use that analogy of like the love tank just rains. And I just, you know, so let me ask you a hard question. Sure. You've done some dumb things. I have too. We all have. <clears throat> yeah. But you've painted me a pretty clear picture of a guy that doesn't like himself. Why? I was afraid you were going to ask me that question because I haven't come up with the answer. I've been in therapy for two years trying to figure it out. And, and I can't, and it's, it's hard. I mean, it, you know, I had loving parents, nuclear family, uh, wonderful Christian household, um, great career in the Marines for, you know, 25 years, you know, some of it active duty and, um, have accomplished a lot, 
became an attorney. Like, I mean, just, you know, a lot of things that I'm like, this is awesome. I've finally done it all. But that, but that's a guy that's been, that's been <laughs> running from hill to hill saying, oh, I have peace on that hill. And then you get to that hill and you're like, well, damn it. I went with me. There's peace over on that hill. And then you start running and you, and dude, nobody can stop you. You can do anything. If you get out of active duty military after 25 years and you go to law school with all those kids and you get out <laughs> yeah. and start practicing, like no one can stop. You can do whatever you want. But that sounds like a guy that's running from himself. Yeah. And if you, if you expect any woman to fill that or that doomed statement that Tom Cruise like whispered across the room. Like if you're waiting for somebody to complete you, dude, that they're ultimately not going to be able to carry that weight. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that's what I'm putting on her. I want her to compliment me, not complete me. And I'm afraid I'm. The only way, only way that can happen. That's a beautiful sentiment. The only way that can happen is if you recognize that your oxygen comes from within your chest, not from her. I don't like my oxygen. <laughs> I know. But I'm telling <laughs> you, as, as an outsider, it looks good. I appreciate that. So what if this? What if, instead of going to a therapist and just talking and talking and talking and talking, what if you begin practicing liking yourself? And that sounds so cheesy. I'm going to tell you something that my counselor made me do. Okay? Okay. And it melted me. Ugh, and I'm tired today, and so I'm probably going to get choked up talking about it. So she called me out once. I may, I don't know if I've talked about it on this show or not, but we, we've, she called me out once. And she said, oh, my, she's an oracle, right? She said, oh, my gosh, you don't like you. And I was like, yes, I do. She's like, no, you don't. I was like, I do. And she said, say it. Say the words, I love this guy. And I started laughing. I was like, I'm not saying that. And she goes, say it. <laughs> And she goes, just say it. Say it to me. I love this guy. You know, she made me make a fist and put it in my chest and say, I love this guy. Ultimately, I couldn't do it. Yeah. It was the like strangest out-of-body experience. Dude, I couldn't do it. And she goes, there it is. She goes, none of the rest of the stuff gets better. None of the rest of the stuff heals until you're okay with you. Because if you're not okay with you, everybody feels you trying to get something from them. And some people want that. But that always ends up in an unhealthy dynamic. Other people, like my daughter or your girlfriend slash fiance slash girlfriend, their bodies sense it. And they feel like they're going to get dragged underwater by two big guys like us. And so they bolt. They bail. They back up. Yeah, I don't want that. I want her to... Uh, yeah, I, I want to love, yeah, God, I can't even say it. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. So here's your homework and I'm, it's going to yeah. be as cheap. It, dude, I expect people listening to go, is that a 200 pound Texan talking to a former Marine, telling him to put his fist in his chest and look in his bathroom mirror and say, I love this guy five to 10 times a day. Yes. That's what's happening right now, right now. <laughs> But yeah. I want you to do it. And listen, when you say it, I want you to intentionally relax and drop your shoulders down. Because you can probably flex through it. That's what you've been doing your whole life. You flex through law school. You flex through basic. You flex through all your promotions. You flex through all of it. That's what you could do. But you can't flex through making some woman feel safe, especially with someone who's already just been burnt to ash. That has yeah. to come from the inside out. The only way that happens is if you admit, I got to practice like being okay with me. I can't expect somebody to carry that. I'm just going to tell you on this side of it, it's healed my relationship with my daughter. It's healed my relationship with my son. It's healed my relationship with my wife. It's made me a general better person to be around, a safer person to be around. Because I'm not grabbing every person in my life and saying, hold me up, 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 hold me up. I'm able to walk into a room safe, whole on my own two feet and look around and say, how can I love each and every one of you? And hey, here's what I need to be loved, guys. I'm just going to put that out there. 
man, that's a totally different dynamic. So starting today, you to put your chest in your hand and look in the mirror and say the words, I love this guy. And I want you to do that every day for the next 30 days. And then tell your wife or tell your fiance, maybe your wife one day, girlfriend, I've been expecting you to hold me up and I'm sorry. And whenever somebody can't hold me up, I get nervous and then I get clingy and then I go looking for, I start hiding things. I, hold, I keep secrets. No more. No more. No more. <sighs> Hang on the line, brother. I'm going to send you a copy of Building an Unanxious Life as my gift to you. Read that, dude, and it'll give you a road map from point A to point B. I'm going to start living into these things as I practice learning to be okay with myself. And it's good to go to counseling, dude. Go talk to somebody. But let's just start, stop the loop, the loop, the loop. Let's start really honing in. I love this guy. This guy's safe. And this guy can do hard stuff. This guy can take care of people. And this guy's okay saying what he needs out loud. Whew, do you love me too? And then, dude, we'll deal with the we'll deal with the communication stuff on the back end. Let's start at the root. I'm proud of you, brother. Proud of you. And tell the truth, Matt. Tell the truth. We'll be right back. Hey, Deloney here. Look. People always say the holidays are the most wonderful time of the year. And for some of us, the holidays are great. But they're mayhem for all of us. You're probably traveling all over the place, talking to family members you didn't ask for, by the way. Shopping, ugh. Trying to make it to all the parties. And no one will turn off the Christmas music. But inside the chaos, remember, you still have a choice. The choice to take care of yourself. Taking care of yourself begins with a good night's sleep. And I believe good sleep starts with an amazing mattress. That's why my family sleeps on DreamCloud. DreamCloud mattresses have a combination of gel memory foam and coil technology that keeps you comfortable all night. And right now, DreamCloud is running their biggest offer ever exclusively for our listeners. 40% off all mattresses plus an additional $50 in savings by using promo code John Deloney. Visit dreamcloudsleep.com and enter promo code John Deloney to get your new mattress and the rest your body needs. That's dreamcloudsleep.com with code John Deloney. All right, we're back. Let's go out to Salt Lake City and talk to Janelle. What's up, Janelle? Hey, I'm good. Can you hear me? I can. How are you? Okay. I am very nervous. I cannot believe that I'm actually talking to you. I can't believe I'm I'm talking to you. I am so grateful and hope that you can give me words of wisdom today. (laughs) I will do my best. What's up? So my question is, how do you live with someone that has BPD or borderline personality disorder? And the guilt that comes along with that. And so (laughs) the background is um, my son, who is an adult, he's 23. The precipitating uh, thing is that we, he's had several, I, I wouldn't say suicide attempts necessarily, but definitely very strong threats of suicide. Um, And then this last month, he was pulled over um, for having um, an equipment malfunction on his car, but also had an open container in the car and refused to talk to the police And the car is registered in my husband's name, so they called him and said, look, you know, uh, we're happy your son pulled over, you know, can you get him to talk to us? And anyway, it was a long, drawn-out event night. He ended up deciding to go to a hospital on a 72-hour hold instead of going to jail. And... um, so long story short, he, there were no beds anywhere in the state of Utah for him to go to an inpatient place. So I had to go and pick him up and get him out. 
But I had told him, you cannot live with us anymore because drinking and driving was one of our hard stop. You cannot do this while you live here. And so um, then he left and he came home for one night, left and went to be with someone who lives out of state, a friend that came back the week later. In the meantime, I called his therapist, which is the first time I've ever done that. I've never had any contact with his therapist ever, but I was like, okay, he's in a bad situation and bad spot. Um, threatening suicide again, left the state and his therapist kind of led with, well, people with borderline personality disorder, this is, a, you know, suicidal threats and stuff are common. And I just went, what? Like it was so, it was such a validation of everything that we've dealt with with him over the last However many years. Wait, hold on. The therapist gave you your son's diagnostic? Yes, only because, like he told me initially first, you need to call back and leave your message. I will listen to your message. And if I have questions, I will call you back. Gotcha. Okay. So I said, okay. So I called and left the message and told him what was going on. And he called back and he said, because this is a safety issue because he's threatening suicide okay. and now, you, you know, you're not in contact with him and you don't know where he is. This is the only reason that I can talk to you. Okay. All right. I want to, let's pause I, here. Let's pause here for a second. I want to do yeah. this. Um, I want to take a second or a minute or two, if that's okay. And mm -hmm. teach for just a second. Okay. Mm -hmm. To everybody listening, borderline personality disorder. You heard me exhale. <sighs> you heard mom go, I knew it. Here, here's what borderline personality disorder is. And by the way, I love, love these folks. And, whew, man, I'm a pretty differentiated guy. And so if you walk away from me, that's fine. Um, and my kids don't have it or they haven't been diagnosed with it yet. Um, here's borderline personality disorder. Your feelings feel like fire. And so they experience the world differently than other people. So are you, a, the, a listener, casual listener, you get mad, they get enraged. You like somebody, you meet them at a, at a bar and you like them, you, you meet them at church and you like them, their body is a wash in love. I love them. And That's I so love true. them forever and ever, amen. Until... They're four minutes late. And then mm -hmm. I hate them. They're the worst. I destroy them. Right. And so there's this obsession with abandonment and it's often imagined. It's often not real. Like four minutes late. Right. I had, I, I was going to the bathroom and I came out and by the time you get there, that annoyance, like let's say someone's late, five minutes late to a date. I can feel it. And then when I see them and I go, where were you? And they go, Oh, I had to go run to the bathroom. I go, Oh, okay. Often somebody with borderline personality disorder sort of can't come back. When that right. train leaves the station one way or the other, it is gone. Best ever, worst ever, there is no middle ground. And in counselors, we know when somebody comes in and says, hey, I've seen six counselors. You're the greatest counselor of all time. You're the only one that has ever got me. Mm -hmm. Counselors go, uh-oh, <laughs> right? Because here we're going to be on the other side. And... Very, very impulsive. So here's a, here's a picture I want to paint for somebody who doesn't know what this is. Imagine you're walking through the woods on a hike and you're surrounded. All of a sudden bees are all over your arms and legs and they're stinging you all over. You would roll, run, flop, scream, jump in a lake, cover yourself with leaves. You do whatever you could to get these bees off of you. If somebody was to be 200 yards from you and just see you acting, they would think, oh, no, this person's bananas, B-A-N-A-N-A-S. <laughs> but to you, it makes perfect sense. You're getting stung by bees, right? So yeah. if you've got borderline personality disorder, one of the strong characteristics is highly impulsive and often irrespo irresponsible behavior. So when your body, when your feelings feel like fire, you go sleep with four people over a two-day period. 
You uh-huh. go, you don't drink, you drink, right? Yep. You don't tell somebody, hey, I, I can't talk to you today. You burn them to the ground. Or I feel like I can't get a hold of mom. I'm just going to tell mom I'm, I'm thinking about hurting myself. Or a, a classic yeah. line is, I'm having dark, dark thoughts. And then everybody comes back, right? It's this intensity, this paranoia, an actual fear of something that folks around them often can't even see or experience. Very black or white. They call it splitting. It is this or this, period, right? It's either or, yeah. not both and. Whew, so am I hitting, am I, that, that's borderline personality disorder in a nutshell. And the reason I and love you them. Completely, you completely put my son in that nutshell. <laughs> okay. The reason I love them is they experience the world in such a multi colorful way, a powerful way. They, I, I'm, I'm jealous of how joyful they can be. Mm-hmm. And here's what's super frustrating. They're often brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Mm-hmm. And yeah. when they tell me, I hate you. I'm able to walk away and be like, well, my wife loves me and my kids mostly do. So I'm good. My dog's like me. So (laughs) um, it's hard when you're a mom, right? Oh my gosh. Mom guilt is the worst thing on the face of the planet. That's right. And you have probably done the terrible thing, which is Google borderline personality disorder. And somewhere they've said it's, it's got a strong genetic link and you've gone, oh, I did this to him. Well, Yes, but the other part of that also is everything that I've read is saying that it's a lot of it, almost every case, is trauma and trauma and I'm like, to my knowledge, there has been no abuse. To my knowledge, like, we have a really tight, close family, and I just kind of go, okay, how is there trauma for him and did I cause it? And what? So let me tell you the let me I, tell you the problem. Yeah. Let me tell you the the scary thing about the track you're on. And then please just stop the train where it is. Okay. Number one, I was with my wife for 25 years, and there's some things I didn't tell her about what I experienced as a kid. Yeah. Just because you're tight doesn't mean you don't you know. Right. The second thing is that question that you start asking, we're a tight knit family. And what about this? All, if you're not careful, ends up in what about me? Mm-hmm. What did I do? Right. And his pain and his experience of the world somehow becomes your issue. Right. It somehow becomes what about, what about me? And with the, someone who struggles with borderline, it can never, it can never loop back that way. Yeah. I mean, it's like, seriously, he has been this way his, as far as I, I mean, I was mom and I gave birth to him as far as I know and have, who can look back at his entire life. He has been like this. Like his siblings would get mad because I would just be like, Hey, look, he's just different. Like he feels things intensely. So when he's mad, he's pissed. Yeah. And when he's happy, he's, over the moon happy. And I, so I've always, his whole life explained him that way to people. Right. And so I don't know. I'm like, so now that he is no longer living with us, we went down today, mostly my husband, cause I couldn't do it. Cause I cried the whole time okay. to the room that he was staying in. And I said, I just feel like I'm betraying him. By packing up his stuff. In your in your and house? In my house. Okay. And my husband said, you no, know, he has to start learning the consequences of his adult choices. Hmm. And I'm like, I know, but as a mom, I cannot, like, it's so hard. The greatest gift like, you can give him is both, I see you, and I believe you, and here are my boundaries the greatest gift you can and give I him. I feel so guilty as does, a mom does, setting boundaries. I know. And <laughs> that's, that's a, <laughs> those feelings you feel, you're asking him who gets r- so enraged. And he does. Like it's I know, scary. I know, but listen, listen to me, listen to me. He gets so enraged and he has figured out something that 
that numbs that rage? Alcohol. Yep. And you're asking him, when you feel enraged, don't go drive. We have to develop some different behaviors. Right. I'm asking you the same thing. Your guilt and you're allowing him to just keep doing whatever he wants to do because you feel guilty hasn't worked, right? Right. Let's try something else. The greatest gift you can give him is I love you. I believe you that your skin is on fire. You cannot bring cocaine into my house. I believe you that you are in pain. If you make a threat on your life, I will call the police 100% of the time. Every time. And that's not going to be your avenue to me. That's going to be your avenue to a 72-hour hold. Right. An avenue to me is you walking in the front door and letting me hold my baby. I don't care how old you are. Right. But if you act only as a response to the guilt you feel, nothing changes. Yeah. And by the way, he has to go get DBT, dialectical behavior therapy. He has to choose that. That's the path for him. Okay. And you can't do that for him. So what do I do in the future? Because I can just see this cycling around again, that he's going to lose this place where he's staying right now and say, I don't have any place to live. Can I come home? And I'm like, how do you look? I know logically that I can say, no, you can't. But how do you emotionally, the emotional side, my heart says, how do you tell your kid, I'm sorry, you can't come live here? You grieve. Yeah. You allow yourself to feel it. And in the same way, you would tell him, hey, 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 hey. I know you are so angry about being abandoned and you're about to go home with those four women. Please don't. This will pass. I'll tell you the same thing. Everything in your body will scream at you. Let him come home. Let him come home. Let him come home. Mm -hmm. That will pass. Okay. Or you can come home. Here are the stipulations. Here are the boundaries. Right. And be honest. I've not held these in the past. And I'm uh -huh. learning that I have not done you any favors. Yeah. Or you can come home. First time. But you will enroll in DBT. And I would like to, if you feel safe, I would like to, um, I would like you to sign that I can have a conversation with your counselor so I can see how you're doing. If you don't go, right. I hear you that it's scary. I hear you that it makes you feel powerless. And here's the truth. The truth is you can't live here unless you're actively pursuing care. Yep. And I will tell you, mom, borderline personality disorder has a high rate of success for treatment. And it is hell. And it's long. Because you basically have to learn inside my body that what my body feels in any given moment is not the truth. And that's just tough right. to, to reimagine, I mean, re experience life, right? Right. That's hard, hard, hard. He's yeah, got, a, he's got a tall order ahead of him and he can do it. Yeah, I'm just, it's, it was so interesting because I felt like a thousand pound weight lifted off me when I finally heard that. Mm -hmm. I was like, I've been throwing darts at a wall and now I actually have a target. Except here's like, the problem. Okay. Here's the problem, mom. You don't have a target. He does. Right. Right. You have been solving his problems his whole life and you can't solve this one. You're right. But I feel like at least it gives it an identity and a name. Oh, yeah. We named the dragon and on this one. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, I'm not crazy. Nope. Because, you know, he goes into his rages and telling me how stupid and dumb I am. And you know what I mean? Like, you just feel like an idiot. But hold on. That's when you stop and say, I'm going to stop you. I hear you that you're very mad. I believe you. You are not allowed to be disrespectful in my house. 
to me or your father, period. So if you yeah. choose to be disrespectful, you're choosing to leave. Oh my gosh, you and that. I'm telling, I'm going to stop you right there. This is your last shot. Mm-hmm. You're choosing to leave. I prefer you to stay. I want you here. And All by right. the way, that interaction is not going to solve this. He's got to go get very directed therapy. Mm-hmm. And it's hard. It's hard. He's got to learn yep. tolerance for that fire feeling. That he body feels like it's on fire, but it's actually not. Yeah. And then he's got to learn some new behaviors in place of the ones that are impulsive and ultimately destructive. He's got to retrain right. his body as to what feels normal. That's tough, 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 tough. So I can just continue to tell him that I love him and I support him. and All day long. I love you. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the most important things. I see you. I see you. And here's the truth. You can't do that. Right. Or you cannot live here. I would be honored if you would have dinner with me every Wednesday night and lunch with me every Sunday afternoon. Right. Forget you. If you're not going to let me live here, I don't want anything to do with you. I hate that. I hear you. And I know you're mad. I hear it. But you can't live yep. here. But I would really love it. If I could buy you dinner on Wednesdays and Sundays to catch up, see how you're doing. Right. And if you fulfill program A, B, C, and D, I'd love to figure out helping you get an apartment or helping you move back in. Or I'd love to go to therapy with you. See what I'm saying? Right. We're not abandoning him, which is his worst nightmare. Right. We are saying I'll walk alongside you, but he doesn't get to dictate. His, his volatility doesn't get to dictate this relationship. His stable mother and father do. And over time, hopefully, that is something he can anchor into, finally. Because he lives an anchorless life. And he's just whipped around by feelings. And by the way, for those of you like wondering, like, oh, is that real? Borderline personality disorder is very, very real. And the feelings, the intensity is very real. I've seen it. It is. Wow. Deep compassion for folks who struggle with that. And my goodness, they're some of my favorite people on the planet. But again, I don't have one that's a child, so I can walk out of a room and be like, hey, dude, I'm, I'm not going to do this, but I love you. And when you're ready to, to hang out, I would love to. One of my favorite people. I've had students over the years that were brilliant and hilarious and so fun. And whew, when things got sideways, like, it was tough, very, very tough. Then deep shame and all of it looped back. Here's what I'm saying. Be present. Let them know you see them and you hear them. And then you got to hold firm on the boundaries. And it sounds like, Mom, it would be good for you to go talk to somebody too, to have somebody walk alongside you give you some tips and some support and some tools on how to love somebody, be in a relationship with somebody that struggles with borderline personality disorder. It's very, very hard. Whew. And let's set down the bricks of guilt and what did I do? What about me? Let's, 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 let's don't do that. Let's make it about what kind of home do I want to have? What are the boundaries I want to build? And how can I love and support him? Because my guess is, mom, you didn't do anything wrong. truth is you got a hurting son let's head that way i'm grateful for you janelle thank you so so much for the call we'll be right back hey good folks deloney here with some great news you get to choose whatever you do good or bad moving forward the choice is yours and when you're intentional about making good choices over time those become healthy habits they almost become automatic like choosing to slow down and make time for a daily practice of prayer and meditation. One thing that has helped me with my daily practice is Hallow. Hallow is the number one prayer app in the world, and they're giving you three free months to get started. That's three months for free to prioritize your mental and spiritual health and be intentional about finding peace through calming music, through guided prayers, meditation, and more. And by the way, Hallow isn't just Catholic. You can tailor the content towards your faith tradition. Or if you don't have a faith tradition, it's a great place to start. From scripture readings to prayers to journaling, Hallow makes it easy to practice mindfulness, build a deeper, more meaningful spiritual life, and choose peace. 
Remember, Hallo is giving you 90 days free. Imagine the peaceful habits you can establish in 90 days. Go to hallow.com slash Deloney today to start your free trial. Just follow the simple prompts at hallow.com slash Deloney for 90 days free. All right, we're back. Let's go out to Provo, Utah and talk to dear Marie. What's up, Marie? Hey, how's it going? We're partying. What's up? What are you up to? Oh, thanks for taking my call. I appreciate it. Of course. What's happening? Um, so my husband has seemed to have a change of, I don't know if you'd call them values, but like, I guess values over the past couple of years. Um, and I'm just, I don't know how to like respect him and his views and still hold true to what's important to me. Yikes. So give me some insight. What is he, what is he, I mean, this sounds like you are at the edge here. Like, what is what has he changed his values on? Well, I feel like, I mean, it's like little things. Like, um, I'm a pretty conservative person. And so, like, swearing has never been, like, an awesome thing for me. And so, it's little, like... <laughs> I know a lot of conservatives that swear like, like <laughs> sailors. You, you don't like swearing, and he didn't, and now he does. And now he does. Okay. And then, but then it escalates to the way we're parenting. We have four kids together. And so then it's like, he thinks it's completely fine for a six year old to watch like PG 13 movies or things that I feel like are too violent or things like that. And he thinks it's fine. And so like, it's just, there's a wide range of things. What are one or two that are driving you like scaring you, making you uncomfortable? Um, well, I think, um, we both grew up in the same religion and now he's having, um, he's, he's still somewhat believed, but he also likes to say that I've been brainwashed. Okay. And so like the way he speaks about it to me, um, but yeah, I just, I, I, he felt, I don't know. I don't know. He's, he says he's always been an angry person. And for a long time, he's tried to like not be that way. But I kind of almost feel like he's slipping into, well, this is just me and it's okay. And I almost kind of like it. And so I think that's one of the things that are scaring me the most. Is he becoming abusive? Um, I wouldn't say physically, but like there are like emotionally some stuff that's happening that I don't love. Give me an example of it. Um, he, he curses like a sailor, right? And and so before it was always, um, he would do it occasionally, like if he were to hurt himself working or doing something, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then it changed to instead of calling inanimate objects those names, he turned it on to me. Mm-hmm. And so now I'm getting called those things. Have you have I you don't. said you will not curse at me in my home? Yeah, I've tried. What is it what does he say to that? He I he almost kind of takes it as a challenge. Like, well what are you gonna do about it? I have something in my guts, Marie, that tells me there's something deeper here. Because I'll just be honest. I've had periods of my marriage of 21 years when I completely walked away from my childhood faith. Walked away completely. My wife has had seasons when what she believes now is radically different from what she believed when she was married. Yeah. And both of us have loved being a steady partner for the other person while they're reconsidering things, learning new things, leaning on doubt, leaning on conviction, all those things. Mm -hmm. But at no point has it ever turned to me versus you. Right. And that's what I don't, that's what I don't love about the situation. And like, I know that sometimes I haven't handled things perfectly, 
but I still just feel like there's no, 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 no. no. Hold on. If you ask your husband, do not swear at me. And he then fires up a bunch of swear words and says, what are you going to do about it? That's a power flex. Right. And that rarely happens in a vacuum. Yeah. That's a dude that looks down on his wife with disdain. She is beneath him. She's not a person to be respected. I wouldn't do that to a, I, I swear too much, okay? Like, I run my mouth too much. But also, I try my best to be respectful. Yeah. And even when Kelly's like, hey, can you just chill on the diarrhea jokes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, depending on where we are. Right. You see what I'm saying? It's not like, oh, you wait now. Just That's just dumb. That's just disrespectful. Right. And so that's contempt. Right. That is a relationship that's be, being held together by string and duct tape. Right. What's the deeper issue here? Is he seeing somebody oh, else? I, no. No, I mean, we we definitely have don't have enough time to get to all issues, but no, there's other things going on and okay. I, don't, I don't know. So how can I help? I just, I want to know how to not feel like we're fighting about everything. Like I feel like our views are so opposite on most things. And I just, I want to know. Views are not the problem. Views are not the problem. It's the respect by which you treat each other. That's the problem. I've got very few of my closest friends share my specific faith in the way that I believe it. Very, very few of my friends follow up and down with my political beliefs. Very few, if any. Ideological beliefs, beliefs about love and care and marriage, very, very few. But the way we engage each other and the way I respect them and the way they respect me guides everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a great fallacy of the culture we live in now, which is you have to believe every single thing I do exactly the way I believe it. And I think that's nonsense. It's not real. But right. we do have to be like respectful human beings and treat each other with dignity. Otherwise, we're children. Right? We're children. And so I don't think it's a matter of you'll have different beliefs. It sounds like your husband's treating you like dirt and my question for you is why it almost seems like you're giving him a pass you're trying to make the problem the beliefs and not him well I can't do anything about him <laughs> but you can yeah, flip I the lights on and call a spade a spade Ultimately, here's the deal. You have to have an or what statement. When you get down to somebody being super disrespectful or doing things that you think hurt your kids, which if you are showing young children violent movies, you are hurting your kids, period. If you're swearing at your kids, screaming and cursing at your children, or you're cursing at their mom in front of them, you're hurting your kids, period. If you land there, if you're punching holes through sheetrock, I'm not hitting anybody. Okay, you're creating an environment where everybody is terrified of what you're going to do next. If every time mom packs the kids up and is going to church, dad's sitting on the couch making fun of mom, yelling at mom, you're so brainwashed, you're such an idiot. Then you have to make a choice. This is the bed I've made, I'm going to lay in it. Or... Here's my or what statement. If you treat me like this again or scare the kids like this again, we are going to leave. And if you don't have an or what statement, then your husband's question rings true. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. 
and that feels like it's closer to home than you want to believe, right? Yeah, probably. Like at the very beginning of this call, you have a tone in your voice that says you are about to walk out that door and never turn around once. Do you dream about that day sometimes? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Can I tell you something? You're not a bad person for having that thought. Do you have a place you could go for a season for a couple of days? Not really. You have a mom and a dad or a sister or a cousin you could go stay with for a while or a girlfriend? Nothing local. That's fine. It doesn't have to be local. Where are your tears coming from? Are you mad at me? And that's okay if you are. Are you mad at him? Or are you is the realization of the true reality that you live in starting to wash over you? Or maybe all three? No, it's just, yeah, it's just, it's just hard. Yeah. Because we go in these phases where we're fine and we're not. But are you and fine? Are you, are you fine because you're playing peacekeeper? Probably. Or are you able to drop your shoulders and make your jokes back? <sighs> Let me ask you this. Do you have a friend, a girlfriend there in town that you could sit down and go have coffee with and just put all this on the table and tell the truth? Yeah. Would you consider doing that? <laughs> There's something about saying it out loud in the physical presence of somebody else that crystallizes it and makes it real. And sometimes it shakes us out of our stupor. Because you spend a lot of your life numb and a lot of the time in your own head, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. God, you deserve a, a different kind of life than that, Murray. You deserve to be loved and cherished and challenged. And you and your husband never have to believe the same things, but y'all do have to treat each other with respect. And you deserve laughter and rambunctious sex, even though you have four kids, for God's sake. You and you like you are worth all that. Fun, building things, planning for things, having people over, you're worth all that. And it just feels like you have stuck like stuffed you so far down in a in a sock just to keep the peace inside your own home. Is that like my only option? Like, you deal out an ultimatum? Is I don't it, think that's going to go over well. Of course it's not. It's not supposed to go over well. It's supposed to keep you safe and whole. If you tell me that my first thought would always be we're going to get out of the house, change the environment and go somewhere. Preferably over a meal where we can go slow and talk. And you for the first time can be fully 100% honest if and only if it's safe. It's not safe then you can't do it. You're going to get hurt. Either physically or emotionally or both. Or if the kids are going to pay the price for your honesty. 
then you have to get a therapist. You have to get a professional and you have to walk that route. But if you haven't done that and you take your husband out and say, hey, when we got together, we both believed this. We both believed this. We both believed this. And over the last few years, things have changed. Cool. People change. Esther Perel says, most adults have three to four or five great loves in their lifetime. And if they work really hard, it's with the same person. I love that. I'm a very, very different person than the woman, than the, the woman, than the man my wife married several times over. That's awesome. But if you could tell your husband, hey, you've changed. I've changed. Our whole life is different because we've got four kids. And now that we've got four kids, we're buttoned up against some different beliefs. I don't believe six-year-olds should watch violent movies. It really makes me feel gross when you curse and yell at me. It makes me feel unsafe and scared. I'm just picturing myself, my wife taking me out and telling me those things. I would want to crawl under the table. I'd be so ashamed of myself. And I would commit then and there to never do that again. But if you've done that and your husband's response is, <laughs> what are you going to do about it? Then yeah, you may be at ultimatum stage. And if you think he's going to hurt you, you think he's unsafe, then you have to get some professionals in your area, whether it's the police, whether it's a licensed therapist, whether it is some sort of other person in your life to have some of those conversations with. Because the alternative is your four kids growing up in a house and they think this is what love is. And this is what safety is. And this is how husbands treat wives. And let's make no mistake. I read the data. Are you working full time? Yeah, I am. be really scary to be a single mom with four kids, wouldn't it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Both economically, practically, professionally, it's a nightmare. So I'm not saying any of this is easy. I'm just saying I'm sick to my stomach for you and I wish so much better for you. What are you thinking? I tried, we tried counseling for a little bit and I just, I wish we could go back to it, but things started to get honest and he decided he didn't want to go back. So, so he chose his comfort and he chose, he chose his fantasy world over a united healed marriage. That's what it feels like. That's not what it feels like, hon. That's what it is. And I'm so sorry for you. I'm heartbroken for you. I guess the other option here, if you're, if you will convince me that you're safe, the other option here is, is for you to go see a counselor on your own and begin to talk through, I need some new tools and some new skills so that I can begin to defend myself, stand up for myself, and ultimately make a transition plan if that day arises. I wish with all my guts I had better news for you, Marie. But if you have a partner who says, I don't care what you say. Oh, yeah? Watch this. You think that's bad? Watch this. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You want, to, you want to tell the truth in a counseling session? Well, then screw you. I'm never going again. These kids are a bunch of babies. They can watch that. They're fine. Quit being such a whiny brat. You brainwashed. Like, dude, you live in that world? I wish I had better news for you, man. But that's a toddler. You're married to a toddler who simply doesn't respect and love his wife. You deserve more than that. And the path from where you are right this second to being healed is a treacherous and scary one. Make no mistake. 
So if you're my friend, if you're my sister, if you're one of my buddy's wives, call me. Your, well, if you're one of my buddy's wives, that's a whole different conversation. Whew. I think it starts with getting with a girlfriend and saying, I need to tell you some hard things and some very deep things. And my pro, I know that you withheld on this call. You didn't tell me everything, and that's fine. I totally understand that. But you sit down with a girlfriend and you tell her everything. Here's what we're going through. And I don't know what to do next. And you call a counselor and say, here's everything. I don't know what to do next. Let's start at those two places and get some people who live in your ecosystem, in your community, around your family. Let's get them speaking into this. Whew. But I think you deserve more. I think you deserve more. And if your husband wants to call into the show, I'd love to talk to him. He won't, but I'd love to talk to him. Thanks for the call, Murray. We'll be right back. Hey, what's up? Deloney here. Listen, you and me and everybody else on the planet has felt anxious or burned out or chronically stressed at some point. In my new book, Building a Non-Anxious Life, you'll learn the six daily choices that you can make to get rid of your anxious feelings and be able to better respond to whatever life throws at you so you can build a more peaceful, non-anxious life. Get your copy today at johndeloney.com. All right, we are back, and now it's everybody's favorite segment, Am I the Problem? Hey, Joe, do you have, like, some uh, mustache Camaro, like, jeans tucked in your boots music that Kelly loves? (laughs) (laughs) Ah, Kelly. I just imagine when you clean the garage, this is what you listen to. You have, like, a marble red, and you're just, like, hanging out of your mouth, and you just clean the garage. Turn that back up, Joe. Where do you think I live? <laughs> and you got jean shorts on. <laughs> like, <laughs> and your kids are like, Mom! And you're like, quiet, kids. <laughs> Seriously. Joe, that was money. All right, so what's up? I'm the problem, or am I the problem? Yes, you are. Listen, yes. lady, listen. Am I the problem? Let's do this. Go for it. All right, this is from Patrick in Georgia. My wife gets upset with me when I tell our daughter to go play or go do something else. However, my daughter constantly seeks attention from either my wife or myself all day long. After half the day, I start to feel like I can't have a coherent thought anymore. I tell her to go play or to do something else. Am I the problem or is it me? Or am I the problem in saying this to her? Am I being unreasonable? No. Your kids need to have alone time. They need to have boredom time. They need to have imagination time. Your kids need to learn how to self-soothe over time. Now, if you keep telling your kid, go do something, go play, sometimes the landscape of possibility is so great that can overwhelm a kid. So you can say, my wife taught me this, you can say you can go play Legos or you can go color. Those are your two choices. I don't want to do either of those. I get that. And it feels super boring. But right now, I have a project that I'm working on. I need to do this adult thing that does not include kids. So, you know, color, you're going to do this. And they'll go, and they'll go color. Or they'll go play Legos. And their body will figure out, oh, not the end of time. Not the end of time. But if every time you they come back, you stop everything, you're like, what? 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 then it's kind of like uh, like a slot machine. And every time they push the button, it spins and they win. And they spins and they win. They've got to learn to walk away from the slot machine every once in a while. So I don't think you're the problem. I love putting kids in a gambling, you know, analogy together. <laughs> I, I know. I'm trying. I'm trying, Kelly. As the show goes, Bew. Hey, we had our best month, best month again. <laughs> yes, we did. The best month. Best month ever. <laughs> I think we just need to sign off and call it a day. I think you hurt my feelings sometimes in your camo jacket. Just in case a deer hunting expedition breaks out, Kelly's got it covered. Hey, (laughs) I was about to say, y'all be nice to each other, but I'm not being very nice. I know I caught myself being a little bit of a hypocrite. Hey, stay in school, don't do drugs. I'll see you soon. Bye.